Welcome to Lion Country. We're in South Africa on the trail of its most formidable felines. Tonight we're going to dissect two big cats, a lion but also a tiger. We want to find out whether they're actually the same animal but under different skins. We want to learn how they roar. I think there's about a 5% chance this is going to work. <laughs> And we want to see the kind of anatomy, the powerful anatomy, that makes them such extraordinarily successful predators. So what we have here is a nice soft pussy cat claw. But when this animal wants to, it pops out the switchblade. And here we have the danger zone. Join us as we go deep inside the big cats. is a defining feature of big cats that separates them from their smaller domestic cousins. The mystery of how and why they make this thunderous sound is one of the first things our dissection team will investigate. Here at the Royal Veterinary College, this lion and tiger, who both sadly died in zoos, are about to undergo a post-mortem in front of student vets. We'll use this opportunity to look under the skin of these mighty predators to reveal how they work. Biologist Tecumseh Fitch has a special interest in how animals produce sounds. Uh, that larynx is going to be right near the surface. Yeah, I can feel it here. You can get it? He shares this obsession with another vocal enthusiast, Joy Reidenberg. Oh, thank you. She rarely passes up the opportunity to investigate the larynx of a new animal. They're both trying to understand how big cats roar. The anatomy of this animal is actually much more similar to that of a human being than it is to that of a domestic house cat. So while in most respects this, this animal is very similar to, to a pussy cat at home, in this respect these big cats, the roaring cats like tigers and lions, are actually quite unique in a way that's very similar to that of our own vocal anatomy. The domestic cat makes its purring sound by vibrating the vocal cords in its larynx or voice box. The lion's larynx is much bigger and it sits lower down the throat, just like ours. The larynx is here. This is the okay. top of the larynx right there. Yeah. Just to give you a sense, if you were holding a human voice box, mine would be about this big. Okay, so look at this thing. They know that the larynx has to move a long way down from its normal position that's kind of up here where you can kind of see my Adam's apple here. But in a roaring animal like a lion, it pulls its larynx down with these strap muscles. When a lion roars, it extends the vocal tract like a trombone slide, using muscles that pull the larynx towards the rib cage. Quite how the lion produces such an unusually loud, deep roar has never been fully understood. Tecumseh has seen similar anatomy in many other animals, but this is the first time he's looked down a lion's throat. To trace back the strap muscles, they're forced to cut through the rib cage. I want to get in here and see what's really going on. Jesus, look at this. It just keeps going. I can't see how much further it goes. 
So here's the first rib, second rib. It's definitely below that. It looks like it may be between the second and the third rib. Just what have you found? The, the muscles that pull the larynx down are attached much deeper than I've ever seen in any other animal. And they seem to go halfway down into the chest. I have never seen anything like this. All the animals I've dissected, these muscles attach at the top. They don't go all the way down. Yeah, here it is. I can't believe this. We're making a scientific discovery on TV. <laughs> <laughs> that never happens, does it? The guys are very excited at the moment because they have found what is essentially a new scientific discovery as far as they're concerned, which is about the fact that the larynx may be able to be pulled down by a lion far further down than they ever thought before, which makes this bigger distance between its nose, essentially, or its mouth, through to where the larynx is, and that means potentially making a much deeper, bigger, more impressive roar. <laughs> To fully understand these cats, as well as the dissection, Joy and I will be doing observations and experiments in the wild. Whoa, that was really scary. <laughs> he was right behind us. Right, he was right next right, to us. Right, by her. Not being able to see him and to hear him that loudly right behind us. It was very scary. <laughs> How far do you think that sound would carry? Well, a human ear can hear it at about four or five kilometers, depending on the terrain. So lions probably can hear it a bit further than eight, nine, ten kilometers. So when you hear this roar at night, you can't see who's making it. Basically, it sounds like a great big thing. And by pulling it just a little bit lower, it can sound that much bigger, that much more fearsome, and thus defend its territory that much more effectively, or perhaps attract mates that much more effectively. So it's a beautiful example of a gradualistic Darwinian adaptation where and it looks like at least this individual lion has figured out a trick, a dirty trick to enable it to go even further than, than an ordinary mammal would. The big cats evolved roars to help them defend large territories. So how would our lions react to the sound of an intruder? We're going to set up a field experiment at Velgavonden Game Reserve to find out. Watch this thing at 10, uh, 10 smash fingers as it rotates. We've got one of the male lions behind us in the road and Back behind us over there, in a tree, we've set up uh, some loudspeakers to play another male's roar, a roar from a, an intruder male that could be coming in here to try and take over his territory and see what happens. Lion researcher Paul Funston has built up an impressive collection of roars from recordings in the wild. <laughs> So is it, is it more of a stay away or more of an invitation, I want to challenge you? I think it's primarily a stay away, but um, there's the second roar coming. But um, it's also a challenge. So this, the tape is set up to sort of simulate a typical bout with gaps every three to four minutes between each roar. Bout would normally comprise about an hour or so, telling the females that they're around and and telling any other males in the area you know, that if they did want to potentially have a conflict, that um, this is where they will be for the next hour and a bit. <laughs> they can make an appointment and come visit Well, them. basically, they could make an appointment and <laughs> come visit them, sure. He just doesn't seem that bothered by this at all. And he looks over towards the speakers, but you know, he's not going over there to investigate, which could mean all kinds of things, lots of explanations potentially for it. Maybe because it doesn't sound to him like a real roar. It may be that he's just supremely cocky. And he goes, don't care. Of course, he could be deaf. Perhaps there's another reason. He's one of two brothers guarding a rhinoceros carcass. A few days ago, this rhino was struck by lightning, and they've been feeding off it ever since. So he's probably reluctant to abandon a rather maggot-infested lunch. So we're going to change the sound to a 
buffalo calf in distress, or a prey call, and see if he is more motivated by hunger than defending his territory. Confused lion because he's come all the way here. He's now trying to work out this kind of alien tripod arrangement that sits here. So we know there's two lions out there, and they would be hearing the call before. Yeah. So he's now making the contact call. This call is to attract his coalition brother to see what's going on. It's one of nine distinct sounds they use to communicate. Back in the dissection room, Tecumseh wants to see the lion's larynx in action by trying to make the dead lion roar. So you just, you're just opening the trick here? Yeah? Yep. How optimistic are you that if we blow some air through here, we're going to actually get I it to work? there's about a 5% chance that this is going to work. <laughs> So pretty optimistic then. That's one big windpipe there, isn't it? Yeah, sure is. Okay, so the we, compressed air is what we're going to put through there yeah, then. That's right. I like your confidence there. Well, I'm just going to do a little test thing right now and just see. Okay. That's vibrating. I can feel that vibrating. <laughs> okay, this is looking pretty good. I think we have a chance. 12%? I'll go to 20. All right, here we go. This has never been done before. <laughs> never will be done again. Yes! <laughs> that is amazing. Okay. So now, now we're going to move the larynx back, so hopefully we'll be able to hear the, the roar getting deeper. Everybody hear the difference? That's... By pulling the larynx, Tecumseh is shown how the lion makes its roar sound so terrifying. And there's good reason to be frightened, as we'll find out when we investigate the anatomy of the kill. Here at the Royal Veterinary College, we're about to start work on the tiger. But it's interesting, isn't it? When you pull back the legs here, you go from, yes, you can imagine this being camouflaged within a, within a jungle or kind of tree setting, but this, all this white, is like sticking up a huge great flag, isn't it? As soon as you start running to something, all you see just masses of white underneath. Is that not a bit of a giveaway? But when they're still in the forest, you've got the dappled light coming through the trees and that you won't see the tiger. You could probably walk up to it and fall over it before it, you know, you'd notice it because they, they just completely blend into the background. Whereas cats that live in open country like the lion tend to have uniform coloured coats because that helps them blend into their environment better. And in the stripes, is that, is that a relatively recent thing? from an evolutionary point of view? Or? Well, we don't really know. Uh, some people think the striping pattern is, has evolved from a, a spotting pattern over time. And obviously, we haven't got skins from many, many thousands or hundreds of thousands of years ago. Cats mimic their habitats with an impressive array of coats. But they've all evolved from a single ancestor. To trace the roots of the feline family, biologist Simon Watt has gone to a big cat rescue centre in Florida. Lions and tigers, like all cats, are members of a group of mammals called the carnivora, or flesh devourers. Here, kitty. It's hard to believe that they're descended from a group of mammals 
small weasel-like things that used to live in the trees. After the dinosaur extinction 65 million years ago, there were new opportunities for hungry predators. Two key branches in the tree of life emerge. The dog-like animals, bears, seals and true dogs. And the cat-like animals, meerkats, hyenas and the true cats. The lion and tiger split apart about four million years ago. Yet surprisingly, they can still mate and have offspring. They've got living proof here. Was it lunchtime? Oh, is this her? Wow, wow. Is this freckles? This is freckles. This is a liger. It's a cross between a lion and a tiger. Its dad was a lion, its mum a tiger. I've never seen one of these before. Come on. And it's just weird. Come on, sweetie. You can see she's got stripes very, very like a tiger's, but that tawny color is unmistakable. It's just like a lion. Even on her neck, she's got the beginnings of a mane. It's unbelievable. Man-made hybrids, like freckles, really shouldn't exist because lions and tigers never come together in the wild. But the fact that the two different species can still breed is testament to their shared big cat heritage. The tiger and the lion look very different from the outside, but how different are they really? Once their skins have been removed, they're virtually indistinguishable, even to the experts. Splendid. One free well tiger skin. Lions and tigers are the same under the skin. From Siberia to the savannah, the cat body plan is almost unchanged. An evolutionist like me loves to look at a group of animals which is just a sort of slight variation on a body plan. In the case of cats, we've got the small ones that hunt uh, mice and birds, medium-sized ones like lynxes that hunt uh, hares, and then large ones like lions that hunt antelopes wildebeest. Unlike the dog family, like wolves, which chase down their prey, run down their prey over a long chase, cats are stealth hunters. They stalk, they sprint and pounce. But whereas the tiger's a solitary hunter, lions hunt in groups. Both hunt over large territories. When you come over a ridge like this, you get a real impression of just how vast this area is. One of the territories on the far side, about 65 square miles, that's eight miles by eight miles, controlled by just two males. Lions are brilliant hunters, but these animals have got to protect their territories because this is a massively important food resource. And this is classic, look at the little one at the back. A little calf, very vulnerable to a lion predator that will pick these off for lunch. The first stage in the anatomy of the kill is the chase. The lion has massive muscles attached to free-floating shoulder blades that give it a long, powerful stride. Got the edge of the scapula there. If we can try and move that, so you've got, from here, it could move forwards. That's incredible, that's about, that's about 15 centimetres or more, I'm, I can move it, look at that. So that's just going to really increase that stride length that we were talking about. Okay. So if you can move that scapula, you're going to so be able to stretch that foot from that little bit further forward, be able to grab and catch their prey. This free-floating forelimb is also why a cat's shoulder blade visibly protrudes when it stalks prey. Try doing this with your own arm and you'll yank it out of its socket. If you were jumping on a wildebeest or something, you'd need to be able to do, to the, to do that. And this muscle would help pull all this round to be able to, 
to grab it. Yeah. But I mean, through here, there are loads of individual muscle groups. Yeah. All of them end up connecting to this incredible network of, of tendons that go out to the digits. Yeah, and you can see right down here that this muscle here is just running straight into the tendon. So we've got one muscle there that, that mm -hmm. starts back here where it's attached. Yeah. Has the muscle running down, then into, into tendon. And so that is... It's all these ones just here. So that's going to extend and f splay out so the toes. I'm, so I'm doing nothing now but holding its radius and ulna here. And then if I pull on this muscle and ulna tendons, that is the action it's doing. So when that muscle contracts, it looks like a tiny little muscle, it's doing that. It's run, 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 kill, and that's all it needs to do with its forearms. Story. Nothing illustrates this better than this video clip from India of a tranquilizer darting expedition that missed its target. The victim lost three fingers, but he was lucky to escape with his life. When the rangers in this park dart lions, they leave nothing to chance. One basic thing for tonight is safety first, please, everybody. At all times, stay within the confines of the vehicles. Do not stand up because you'll single yourself out. These lions are going to be agitated, especially once the dart is in, that lioness is... They're darting a lioness to replace her radio collar to enable them to track her pride across the reserve. It'll also allow me to take a much closer look at a living lion. Any questions from your side? No, no. cool. OK, let's okay. go on with it. Let's go and enjoy it. To draw the pride of lions out of the bush, they tie a dead wildebeest to a tree. Okay, go for it. After a few minutes, the dart starts to take effect. This collar, you want to make sure it stays in place. So if it's too tight, it'll stick on the side of the neck. Too loose, it'll come off the neck. How long will this last? Roughly about 18 months. Okay. And it doesn't bother them at all. As soon as she's woken up from this, she's had the one on before. Doesn't seem to bother. Doesn't care. No. As a vet, I've handled plenty of domestic cats, but I've never been this close to a wild lion before. I should have an hour before it wakes up. I mean, obviously anaesthetised, she's completely docile, but this is a killing machine and this is the business end. We just want to be gentle with her eyes, but we can have a look at the tapetum lucidum, the reflection off that mirror inside the eye that helps amplify the light through the retina for seeing in very dim light conditions. Have a look at the pause for yeah, it. Yeah. Good, Nick. Well, they are colossal, aren't they? Absolutely colossal. And her dew claws. Yep. Okay. And these are the ones that they used to hang on. So if she was jumping on a zebra, for instance, she'd use that claw to just hook into the zebra and then hang her weight on it to bring it to the ground before then using these to be able to start uh, grabbing on to kill. Enormous power. And all this is muscle. In here is the radius and ulna, but all this is just solid, solid muscle. And if that hit you, I mean, that would knock you off, knock you off your feet straight away, wouldn't it? Absolutely. So what we have here is a nice soft pussy cat paw. Looks very cuddly, but when this animal wants to, it pops out the switchblade. And here we have the danger zone. If we turn it around and look at the other side of the animal, you can see the anatomy involved in retracting a claw. If we pull on this muscle from the top, we see that the whole toe moves upward from this position. We can pull it up just like a marionette. And then we can also pull it down with this muscle's tendon, which is coming underneath the foot. 
and that pulls the toe down. And we can wiggle that finger back and forth, just like we wiggle our fingers back and forth. But what we can't do is take our nail and protract it out to make the claw stick out. Our nail is always stuck here. But if you hold this in tension and at the same time pull from the muscle on the bottom, what happens is the claw protracts out. That's called protraction, when the claw sticks out like that. The natural rest position is here, in retraction. But when they want to stick it out, they have to pull on both of these muscles at the same time to cause the switchblade to pull out. And then you get this very long extension of that claw. And that's the weapon. That's unsheathing the sword for these guys. <laughs> It looks just like a human hand, doesn't it? All mammals, in fact all land vertebrates, have very similar hand, all descended from a common ancestor. What's happened is that the skeleton has remained the same, but, but what's changed is the shapes and the sizes, the relative proportions of the bones. A bat wing is also a hand, a mole's spade is also a hand. The skeletons remained, but the bones have changed. The big cat's paws with their deadly claws can bring down the largest prey. It's now they deliver their deadly crushing bite, the final act in the anatomy of the kill. The last stage in the anatomy of the kill is the deadly bite to the neck. This is the tiger. Uh, what, what, actually, I'm not sure now. What have yeah, we got? Yeah, this is the tiger. That's a long one, yeah. And okay, this is I've got the lion. lion. This is the lion. Yeah, so the, the, the similarities between these really big cats become really striking, and part of that is just about its size. People have debated quite a bit which one is larger, a lion or a tiger. The fact is, actually, they're about equivalent. The biggest tigers and the biggest lions are about the same, and you can really see that. It's quite striking if we open up the jaws. It wouldn't be that different looking into the mouth of a lion and looking into the mouth of a tiger. Another very impressive and sadly extinct animal is the saber-tooth cat. And this is the tiger. Just look at the difference in the canines between these two animals. These, again, think about the killing bite that would be possible with a set of canines like this. It's interesting that it restricts the gape of the mouth. Even though you can open the mouth quite a bit on the saber-tooth cat, the actual distance that's open between the ends of the canines on top and on the bottom is very tiny. So it's if this not guy a very tried, to get, tried to get Joy's arm, I want your arm. <laughs> <laughs> Even with the mouth open that far, could barely get in there. So it's probably more likely that he would do something like this. Wait, don't bite me. <laughs> <laughs> you know, a, a stabbing, stabbing motion rather than a biting motion. Whereas this one can easily get you. Yes, this guy could, no could question. get my arm. When a lion closes its jaws around the windpipe of large prey like a wildebeest, it'll hold the bite for up to 10 minutes before its victim dies. Back in the field, our anaesthetized lion has been out for almost an hour. But teeth-wise, that's a pretty good mouth apart from those lesions on the tongue. You do get a sense of how rough this is for grooming and stripping meat off. But muscles in this head to be able to kill and also to rip the pieces of meat that it needs to eat off the carcass, absolutely massive. If you try and lift this head, this is an enormous weight in here. The thing that's really striking about this animal's head are these gigantic muscles, these vast muscles. On us, if you look on the side of your mouth, this thing is the equivalent of this muscle. This muscle on us also exists. It's this tiny little thing that you can kind of see tensing but it's just a little sheet of muscle in comparison to this muscle. The lion uses the huge power of the muscles in its head and its jaws to be able to either direct these canine teeth as a killer bite through the top of the neck to break the spine or can suffocate the animal by squeezing its windpipe from underneath its neck. Either way, prey animal ends up inside here. But once he's down to the business of turning this prey into a meal, it goes into scissor mode. So these are these cutting teeth. These are called carnassials, and they basically are quite sharp. They have a, a sharp edge. So two blades are in close contact so that they're really rubbing up against one another and slice very neatly and very effectively through a p piece of tissue. 
But you don't really want these making contact when you're making that killing bite. You don't want to have them run up against each other and perhaps even shatter the tooth. If the sharp back teeth come into contact when a lion makes its powerful killing bite, the result would be a dental disaster. It's overcome this problem by evolving top and bottom jaws that are out of alignment as it bites. And when the lion needs to eat, the jaws slide against each other to slice like a pair of scissors. Our anaesthetized lioness is now ready for the antidote to wake her up. We're going to return to the dead wildebeest used to lure away the other lions to see those carnassial teeth in action. It doesn't take long for a hungry male to arrive. But he senses something's wrong with this easy takeaway meal. He's right. If you look underneath his belly, you can see there's a ridge running underneath the belly there. Mm -hmm. and that this flap of skin called the lingual fold. And so basically that skin is folded in like this. And as the lion engorges, the skin folds open. Oh. So it allows the stomach to distend. Wow. So that's an adaptation for filling the belly to, to engorged. They can eat about 30% of their body weight in one sitting. So it's 50, 60 kilograms of meat. To survive, big cats need other animals to satisfy their high protein diet. In the African bush, every animal must extract energy from the food they eat. They've each evolved a different strategy. Lions may be at the top of the food chain, but are they the most efficient eaters? To find out, we're going to conduct a rather smelly experiment. Looks like we got some elephant poo right here. Okay. Let's get a sample of this. Joy's hot on the heels of the herbivores. Elephants eat more or less anything in their path. And what goes in determines what comes out. Giraffes, on the other hand, are fussy eaters delicately stripping off only the freshest acacia leaves and producing droppings a rabbit would be proud of. I've drawn the short straw, the king of the carnivores. It is reputed to produce some of the smelliest specimens in the bush. Thanks. That is absolutely perfect. Not only in a, a magnificent sight of it walking past, but the fact that it chose to do a dump right there is just brilliant, because when it's gone, I can go and pick it up. <laughs> I can smell it from here. That's not good. You get a nice big bit there. I think that's going to be plenty, David. Yeah. Back at the lodge, we've set up a dung lab. By burning our samples in a bomb calorimeter, we'll see how much heat they produce 
which will tell us how much energy each animal has extracted from its food. Temperature is 2.57. Okay, so in terms of energy of the food goes in compared to energy in the faeces at the end of digestion, how are the test results coming out? The wilder beast extracts about 40% of the energy ingested compared to the zebra that extracts about 50%. How does the lion sample compare? Uh, compared to the zebra and the, and the wildebeest, it extracted about 70, 60 to 70 percent of the energy from the meat, that's, which is very effective. That's very incredibly efficient. high, very, very efficient. High. The vegetarian diet requires large labyrinthine guts, as we discovered in our elephant dissection. Can you stand back, please? Yet they're surprisingly inefficient at extracting energy from their food. So what's the secret of the big cat's guts? When you compare it with like a herbivore, which has an incredibly complicated digestive system, this actually is, is just very simple, isn't it? We've got stomach yeah. and a whole load of pipe work to do all the absorption and then to produce faeces at the end. End of story. Yeah, but because meat's so easy to digest, you don't need a very long tube to, to digest it in. So compared with a herbivore, this is a very, very short gut. And that's a function of being so high up the, the food chain that yeah. your food is already pretty well processed from the, from the difficult to digest stuff which the herbivores have already done for you. Lions spend most of the day sleeping after feasting on a kill. It seems like the perfect strategy. As meat eaters, lions let their prey's guts do the hard work of processing low energy food. That way the lion stays lean and mean, building up powerful muscle to hunt down their prey. Lions don't always have it their own way. Only one in five attacks is successful. Lions and other cats are superb killing machines, but of course they don't always succeed. They don't always make a kill. Antelopes, or whatever their prey are, are also superb running away machines, superb escaping machines, but they don't always escape. That's exactly what you'd expect, that there would be some failures on both sides. And there's actually an additional reason why you might expect a slight imbalance in that evolutionary arms race. You can express it in the words of an Aesop's fable. The fox is running for its dinner, but the rabbit is running for its life. So far, our investigations have revealed that under their skins, lions and tigers have virtually identical anatomy. But there are key differences that can't be understood by dissection. Tigers and most other cats lead solitary lives, whereas lions live in unique family groups. We're now going to look at the anatomy of the pride. These family groups probably evolved to help lions take down large prey and to defend their territories. It's resulted in a complex hierarchy.
We're now going back into the territory to try to find the pride we tracked on our darting foray. About two o'clock, straight over here, David. The mother whose collar we replaced last night is back with her cubs. But as usual, the males are away on patrol. Like looking for a needle in the haystack. The males form bands of brothers who work together to defend their kingdom against rival males from the neighbouring territory. There, 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 under the tree here. Stop there. There they are. There's our two males. They are the kings of this place. Absolutely awesome. God, look at the testicles on that. How does this guy fit into the male coalition and the whole pride? He's the big male, as we call him, uh, the Induna or the boss around here, or main peanut in the packet, but he's the dominant male, and they'll actually mount the other male sometimes as a show of dominance over the other male. Wow. Uh, and how old do you think he is? He's roughly about eight years old, so he's in prime of his life. But at this stage, he's separate from the pride, so I assume these two males are busy marking their territories. They're busy going around the entire boundary, making sure there's no other males in the area, uh, quite often vocalizing a lot, telling other male lions that this would be their prime area, and marking territories by um, defecating and spraying their urine on bushes to mark their territory. All cats spray urine as a form of territory marking, saying who's been where and when, and if we look at the anatomy, the big male cats have got a big advantage in terms of, of their penis and which direction it points. If, you, if we have a look here, I mean... Let's reveal the king of the jungle's crown jewels. Actually, it's all very small. Isn't it? it is very small, very compact, and normally, of course, it, it just sort of hangs down and points backwards quite naturally. And so when it wants to spray urine, it goes in the right direction. Do you want to dissect down here a little bit? A lot of it's hidden round through the pelvis, isn't yeah. it? Yeah, a lot of what would become engorged is actually hidden away there. And it's the shape of, of this thing when it's engorged which helps it push forward in the sure. right direction so for mating. So normally, when it would be spraying, it would be kind of like that. That's right, yeah. As it gets engorged, it's then moving so round right. into a position like that for yeah. reproduction. Yeah. Successful dominant males will mate for 30 seconds every 30 minutes, sometimes for four consecutive days. They leave nothing to chance in their effort to ensure they pass on their genes. They know they may have to fight off younger males looking to start their own pride. Across the river, on the other side, we're looking for the rival male coalition. We don't have far to look. They're still guarding that rhino carcass. Is that the bark? That was the bark. Yeah. Tail flitching, years back. Just a, a slight warning. These are two young male lions, uh, two different mothers but the same father, roughly about five years old. Um, they've taken over this territory in the southern part of the reserve roughly about two months ago. Um, as you can see, very young males, uh, manes, like, looks like they haven't shaved for about two weeks. But um, up and coming, they're also starting to get a bit more dark. You can see the one's got a darker mane than the other. Normally that's a sign of dominance. The more darker the mane, the more dominant it is. Yeah, I mean, it's interesting there have been studies done where the, the um, darker mane and is attractive to the females they check it out first so it must it must have a really important role to play in a bizarre experiment carried out in the 90s scientists introduced stuffed lions with different colored manes to see which one attracted the lionesses dark manes are a sign of increased testosterone even though they can't have smelled that convincing the females were still attracted to the dark mane and even this male approaches his stuffed rival cautiously. And this is almost certainly a good example of what Darwin called sexual selection as opposed to natural selection. Sexual selection means that males in this case are selected because of their success in outreproducing rival 
males, often because they're more attractive to females, but sometimes because they're more intimidating to males. Females need to choose the most dominant, dark mane, testosterone-rich male for a very important reason. In the cats, in the big cats in particular, there's a lot of male infanticide. If some intruding male comes in, pushes away the former dominant, the first thing he does is kills the babies, kills the young animals. So the, from the female's point of view, the last thing she wants is to invest all these resources in gestating a young, giving birth to her cub, and then at three months or six months, another male comes in and kills it. So what she wants is to ensure that she, she mates with a dominant male, with a powerful male that can keep the competition away. Therefore, she can have a pretty good chance that her cubs are going to make it to be old enough to avoid infanticide. In the court of the Lion King, the young princes are initially vulnerable until one day these young pretenders become strong enough to claim the throne. We've seen how the biggest cats in the feline family have adapted their anatomy to become dominant males and how their paws and jaws have turned them into such formidable hunters. Our big cat dissection has shown that underneath, lions and tigers share the same basic body plan, even though they live very different lives. What's really impressed me, though, about spending a few days with these guys out in the wild is how, through evolution, they've developed a really effective social system, ensuring the survival of their pride. Long may these majestic beasts continue to rule supreme over their vast African kingdoms. Next Tuesday at 9, the Polish pilots who challenged RAF prejudice in the untold Battle of Britain. Now, be one of the very first to see the brand new series of the IT crowd. Just go to 4OD at channel4.com and follow the instructions. Next tonight, Big Brother and it's nomination time.